Hey everybody, this month's roundup is brought to you by Arcane Wonders and their new card drafting game, Gap. And this game is simple and quick and surprisingly deep. It may look at first glance like, you know, just another Uno style mass market game, but there are hidden depths and I'll just spend a few minutes today showing you how it works. So um, depending on the number of players, you might have removed one or two suits and with the rest, you draw uh, four cards that are gonna be out here on the display. And then each player gets a starting hand. In a two-player game, it's going to be six. And then the game is afoot. I'll be the first player. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play one card. And if that card allows me to grab anything from the center, then I'll keep the card I played plus whatever I grabbed. So how does that work? Well, we've got two fours, a zero, and an eight. So if I were to play a four which I don't have, but if I did have a four, I played it, I'd keep my four and I'd grab both of those fours as well. I can't grab those. I do have, however, an eight. So I could go for this. Let's say I play my eight, right? And that means I look up here and, oh, there's an eight. So, okay, I've grabbed an eight. And so at the end of my turn, I now have two cards ready to score. And from now on, the numbers don't matter. The numbers only matter when it comes to drafting. The colors matter for scoring. And I'll show how that works in a bit. So anyway, it is now my opponent's turn. And they look at their starting hands. They also don't have a four. They also don't have a zero. So they can't play anything. And it's awesome how cool and shiny these are, uh, you know, to play on a nice sunny day. Although they're still very, very readable while playing. Anyway, so they can't grab any of these because they do not have any fours or zeros. But if they play a card that is numerically adjacent to one of these, they can get them. If they were to play this three, there's always a reminder on every card that, hey, you know what's above and below a three? A two two and a four. And that's a reminder that if they play this three and they can't grab any threes, instead they will grab one two and one four if it's available. And by the same token, if they were to play this one, they would uh, grab one two and one zero. So here's a trick. How about... Now, if they play anything else that isn't numerically the same as these or adjacent, it just stays out there. So let's say they're going to take a gamble. They might just play this two. There are no twos, there's no ones, and there's no threes. So that means they don't get it. But what they're thinking is, hey, next turn, if I play this one, if provided these are both out here, they will get all three of these cards, the one and the zero and the two. So let's see if they pull that off because I'm playing as well. And as it happens, I do not have... Oh, I do. I do have a one. So they could have set me up and what the heck. I am going to play this one and because uh, there's a zero and a two, I'll end up getting both of them. And so uh, things progress and like, no! They have nothing to score yet. They, thought, they set themselves up, they took a risk and it did not pay off. So... What they can do is they can go on ahead and at least play this five. And because, hey, there's a, a there are no threes, but there are five, so they'll take a five. And so now they're starting to build a scoring pile. And then it comes back to me. And I do not have any fours, nor do I have any threes and fives. So I cannot grab that purple. Huh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I got to play something. You know what I'll do? I will play this zero which doesn't let me get anything. And since I don't get anything, it stays out here. But I'm hoping I could get that zero back next turn when I play my other zero. So we'll see what happens there. Although, oh, oh, I just realized that might be a mistake. But let's continue. The, meanwhile, my opponent says, hey, there's a zero and a four. I could get that four with this three, but I don't want to. Instead, they're going to stick to their plan. They're going to play this one, which happens to be next to a zero, and boom. That's a thing of beauty. Oh, the gap is good with them. They just went from zero to hero. And that kind of scares me now. Okay, what am I going to do? I, I cannot get this four because there are, I know no threes or fives in my hand. Um, but, oh, I have a plan. I have a plan. There's a risk. I don't know what's still in their hand. But I, I feel pretty confident this is going to work. I'm going to play this nine. Because there's no zeros or eights. Uh, or nines, that means I lose it. And then they're going to come along, and they're like, well, oh, see, now here's the thing. 
They could play this, but they don't want to. I haven't mentioned scoring, but the way scoring works is at the end of the round, after everybody's played all their cards, you look at your scored, your, your piles of different colors. Whichever has the most, that's your positive score. Whichever has the least, that's your negative score. The gap is the difference. So if I if this were me right now, my positive is three, my negative is one, I score two points. Their positive is four, their negative is zero, they score four points. There's a little bit more to it, we'll get back to it, but that's that's why they don't want any more colors. They just want to be able to dump everything if they can. So they are not going to play this nine because then they would end up having a they would they would it would drag on this. So they're not going to play the nine. They'll and they're not going to play the three because that would get them the four. They'll play the seven and they're hoping I take all of that garbage away or that some other player does. Meanwhile, back to me, I'm like, yes, I'll play this zero to get the nine. Because here's the trick, folks. Remember how I said, you look at your biggest group and subtract your smallest group. What if there's a tie? If that's the case, you add them both up. I've got two stacks tied for my biggest group, so my biggest group is six minus one. And the same thing happens on the bottom. If I have, this is six, but then I might tied for these, this would be negative two. My score would be four. So that is pretty, pretty nice. And my opponent is saying, oh, they have to play a card. Oh, but they're very happy. I got rid of the thing that was bothering them. They'll play this nine. It doesn't mean they have to take anything. So they're still sitting on this rock solid four. And then back to me, I've got to play a two. And here's the thing. This two, I, I have to play it. And since it won't let me take anything, if I could take anything, I would have to. I'm not complaining. I don't take anything. And so I am done. And then my opponent says, oh no, this is a disaster. They must play the three. And because the three lets them take a two and a four, they must take both of these. Boom, boom. And we have finished the first round's draft. And what's the score? Because I've got a tie for my biggest group, they combine. Six minus one is, I just made five points. My opponent, meanwhile, they have four minus one is three points. So it could have been worse. If they had actually ended up somehow with, say, both of these, then it'd be four minus their lowest is tied, so you have to combine them, and then it would be zero. And that would be very painful indeed. So right off the bat, there was a lot going back and forth in this first round. I'm leading four to three. We're going to play to like 15 or 20 or 30 points, depending on how long you want the game to go. And that's what you get in Gap. And uh, now, folks, on with the show. And it's going to be a good show, folks. If I counted right, I think we've got 29 games to talk about today. Uh, 12 of the mine, the rest are in the contributors. And without any further ado, let's get right to it. Kimberly, take it away. Hey, everybody. Kimberly here. And I'm excited to share with you the games I played in June. Now, if I actually told you all the games I played in June, you would be here for quite a while because I have been playing like mad. It's the end of my academic year. I'm in my summer right now, so I have a little bit more time on my hands. And I've also been preparing for the Game of the Year nominees. So I have played all of those Spiel des Jahres 2023 nominees for the Spiel, the Game of the Year, kind of like a, that entry-level family game. And then I've also played that advanced or experienced um, you know, strategy Game of the Year. So if you want to check out my ranking of both of those lists, please check out my, my channel, Tabletop Tolson. I have got two separate videos at the very beginning of July ready for you to watch in preparation for the announcement on July 16th. Those six games I will not include in this list because my list is already 10 long. So I'm going to get right to it and I want to tell you those games that I played in June in the order of favorite to most favorite. So uh, my Oh, and I also have my American Ninja Warrior shirt on because I always do an American Ninja Warrior uh, game of the year and I also have that video coming out on my channel too and it's just loads of fun. I love this. Go Joe. Joe's the weatherman. Joe Morosky, he's my guy. So enough, enough said about stuff at my channel. So here are the games that I played. Uh, and number 10, I have Fairies and Magical Creatures. This is a really lovely light game that allows players to have some nice juicy player interaction while building their deck. They are adding cards to their deck and they are also playing out on this personal player area all of these different tiles like the polynomials um, into this space creating a beautiful path 
with all these lovely flowers and garden um, flowers to look at. It's just a really nice game with a quick, easy action selection and uh, really, really unique cards and beautiful artwork. So Fairies and Magical Creatures starts off my list. Followed, I'm gonna do now Bamboo. Bamboo has a lot of charm, speaking of flowers and beautiful things. Um, this has a fascinating um, action selection with little bitty bamboo sticks that you are going to play out, uh, gaining things like resources, foods, and money, but you're really investing in these tiles that allow you to beautify your own personal player area that has these really um, nice scoring areas. There's three different areas where you score up your lanterns, and your flip-flops and your fun things like that. And so you are beautifying this house, but you're also investing in these um, kind of wor like worshiping or paying tribute to these um, these tiles, these, these things that you're going to get uh, because of your incense. So there's a little bit of that majority uh, in the table. So you're vying for these special ability cards by placing your incense in particular areas. It is just a really, really cool four round game that I think has tons of charm, beauty, and um, artwork. Really, really good. And I like those core mechanics. They work incredibly well. Uh, next is Fabled. Fabled is a game that is just a puzzle. It's this fascinating puzzle of being super, super efficient by playing these location cards out into a spirit world and letting your sages walk along these paths. It sounds really gentle. It sounds very laid back. Um, but you really want to get out a lot of those sages and you want to make them move a lot so they visit these fabled places, giving you bonuses. And the whole game is about converting these uh, lower books, which are the yellow books, the books of... Um, uh, prairie all the way up you go yellow and then it's blue then it's green then it's red for books of sun and it's all about converting books so you are just generating books and it's it's kind of like got this knowledge base to it uh, there are also a lot of variety of scenarios that you can play to change up the game uh, but it's another one of those kind of nice small size like bamboo it's got a really nice compact box um, with a straightforward appeal to I would say um, um, you know Casual gamers, entry-level gamers, lovely, lovely feel. All right, the next one is Kazuka. Kazuka is, uh, it was a recommended on the Game of the Year nominees list, and we got it because it has some um, interesting, it's not trick-taking necessarily, but it is a cooperative game where players are giving information about the cards they have in their hand, uh, and the theme of it is that they uh, everyone's playing an animal in a zoo, and they're all trying to communicate uh, what resources they have so they can break out of the zoo and they can escape. And you have a set number of rounds to make this happen. So the game encourages you to play, 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 adding more cards to your deck, and you are essentially trying to communicate along a path. I have this many number of red cards. I have this many number of, you know, whatever, X cards. And you are don't know what everyone else has. I think that's kind of like the fun about this is that you're not really sure and you can't talk. So it's a very quiet game. And then at the end of the round, you're like, no, oh my gosh, we didn't do this thing. and We didn't do that thing. Um, but it's all about growing and then hopefully escaping at the end. Uh, a really, really fascinating game. Still haven't won it. I've played it three times um, with a, a variety of players and I still can't win this game. It's hard. <laughs> Uh, okay, moving on to number six. This is Exoland. Exoland is a dexterity game where you are balancing these weighted, these calibrated weighted spaceships and things out on the board. And it's just so, so interesting because this board is a circular uh, board that is uh, essentially positioned on this fulcrum and it's going to do wibble wobble wibble wobbles. And you want to get rid of all your spaceship spaceships first. You have 15 of them, three in weight one, three in weight two, three in weight three, four and five. So that's 15. Or you want to nab up uh, most of the planets. I think it's seven out of eight. And to get the planets, you have to go really, really far out in the solar system, which means you're putting your weights down even further on the side. Uh, really, really fun game, fast game. And if you crash the solar system, that's okay, right? It's fine. You just get a black hole and uh, you clear the board and everyone kind of starts over. It's really, really fun. Um, I mean, it starts over in the sense of like adding more. You don't actually get all your pieces back. Um, you just continue playing, uh, but the board is clear for you to put stuff on. Ah, really, really fun. I actually got to play that with my mom and uh, I usually don't get to play games with my mom. <laughs> So uh, super, super fun, uh, very memorable for me. 
Okay, moving on to five, Luddite. Luddite is a roll and write, print and play, and I like it because you roll three six-sided dice and every player at the table has their own board. They are moving their way through this system, trying to hack um, this NED module, and uh, you just play at the same time. So I have the three dice I roll. Everyone puts down what they want on their own board. They're going to get bonuses and resources. They're going to move this needle through this NED network. Uh, They're going to uh, cross off numbers in this crossword style uh, system. They're going to unlock and open these doors. But the really cool thing is that every single turn you roll the dice, everyone has to place one of their die values into the clock, which is their timer. So when your clock runs out of time, you are out of time and you better be at the end escape hatch with your needle um, so that you can do as much damage as possible. Nice 30 minute roll and write. Really, really enjoyed that game. Okay, moving on to my next one, Teotihuacan City of the Gods. This is just one of those revivals for me. It's really nice to come back to games that I have played um, with even new information, new expansions, new material, but reminding me of how good this game is. I love a good rondelle system. This has a rondelle in spades. I love it. It works incredibly well as just that juicy, hearty strategy game. You're going to sit there. It's going to be an hour and a half, two hours, maybe more. Who knows? But it's just really, really cool. You are moving around, gaining cool stuff, uh, building this pyramid in the central area. Um, you also are uh, moving up on these tracks that give you more and more bonuses. It's one of those games where you're like this, and then it gives me that, and it gives me this, and it gives me that, and I'm going to use this bonus on my turn. Um, so it's so a lovely, lovely, uh, engaging game because your workers, um, you essentially pay for things based on how many workers are in that space um, to move to or to essentially activate. Great, great game. Moving on to my top three at this point, I've got Clank Catacombs. I finally got to play Clank Catacombs. Love, love, love. I love Clank. I love Clank Acquisitions Incorporated. I'm excited for the second Legacy game to come out. And I think what Catacombs um, really offers is this new way to play where you are flipping over tiles and building the world as you go, and it really creates such unique opportunities and it just makes the game even more exciting. So if you are used to a lot of the maps, because we've got all the other clanks as well, like clank in outer space and clank in wherever, we have those. But this means that you're flipping over tiles and you don't know if there's going to be a portal. You don't know if there's going to be a dead end. You don't know if there's going to be what you're looking for. And so with the same clank system, I think Catacombs just makes it engaging, fun, exciting, never the same. So I really, really like the features um, that Clank Catacombs offers players. It might be my favorite clank version outside of Clank Legacy. So... We'll see about the second Clank uh, Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated, too. All right, my second favorite is Books of Time. Books of Time really surprised me. I love the feature of actually having books in these three ring binders, or in this case, they're two ring binders, and you are adding cards into a book and you are reading them. And when you read them, you turn the page, but you get all the cool stuff on both sides. So you get to look at both sides of the page. You guys say, I want to activate this page first, and then I want to activate this page, or vice versa. And you get to do all these really, really cool things, gaining those victory points along the way, because there is a track um, that you keep track of, but there's also opportunities. It's one of those great, it's like Teotihuacan. It's like the this and then that, and then I can do that and I can do this. And so there, ha there there's these domino turns that are really fun and you have to strategize because you've got personal goals in um, this game. This you, you That's where a lot of your victory points are going to be at. So you're taking these pages and putting them in your books. You have three books and you're going to be looking at them for a uh, variety of symbols, colors, and order. I really, really like Books of Time. I want to play it again. When I talk about it, I want to play it. And that leaves me with my favorite game that I played in June. It's called The Witcher Old World. I think just Old World is, is the name. Old World. Where is it? Yes, The Witcher Old World. It's right here. <laughs> I already have it on my shelf. Um, this game is, for me, uh, just a lovely build them up. You get your stats, you go and work on them, you go and adventure in this exploration story time at the end of your turn if you're not fighting or you're not meditating. And then you will build up your deck. And I love the deck building feature of it. And then you go and fight monsters. 
And you could fight other witchers and earn their trophies, but you are essentially trying to earn four trophies and or meditate. And the first person to do that wins the game. And I found that it doesn't matter who wins the game because every single time I'm doing something on my turn, it's really fun. And when other players are playing the monsters, they're, they're fighting monsters, you essentially get to engage in that fight by playing the monster, flipping over their cards, selecting if they're going to ram or bite you. And it doesn't make, it doesn't leave you out. And when other players are taking adventures on their turn, like exploring the city or the wild, you are reading the story and giving them the options of A or B. So you're engaged when it's other players' turn, and you're also just f filling out your story as a witcher. I love the IP. I think the game works really well. I just want to play it again right now. I think the solo variant for that works so well. It is the game but you don't have to have other players and all you do is play the whole time. Um, so I enjoyed the solo uh, for The Witcher as well. So that was my favorite game that I played in June and I think that is enough. Oh my gosh, I've done so much, but you know, I didn't talk to you in May. So I included some of the games from May. I included some of the games that are coming up um, in uh, July. So keep your eyes peeled for some of those games that I mentioned in my list that I played in June. Okay, that's it for me. All right, back to you. Hi friends, Ruel here, and I had a great month of gaming. It wasn't as much gaming as I normally do, but I played some really fun titles. I'm going to highlight a few of those here for you today. Let's start with an honorable mention, Lumen, The Lost World. Uh, we played this live here on the channel with Matt from the Silver Metal Tavern as the kickoff to a new series called Ruel Rumble. So this is where I get to hang out with um, friends online here, live on um, Rotto Run Through Twitch channel, and we play a game together and chat and hang out. It was a lot of fun. We played Loom in the Lost World. This is a roll and write re-implementation of Trek 12 by Bruno Cathala. A very cool uh, mechanism where you're rolling dice and you're either going to uh, add, subtract, or multiply the uh, the dice, and that's going to depend. That's going to dictate where you're going to place uh, numbers in the different hexes. And ultimately, it's a game of area control. You have different factions that you can level up, get different abilities, and then you're going to score um, each little area based on you know who has the most there. So, really interesting take on Roller Rights as a, a dueling battle game for there. So, I like that. Um, next, number five. Overboss Duel. Now, Michelle and I played this on my channel as a sponsored preview, and it takes Overboss, puts it onto a shared board, and that's a neat twist to this. It's a shared board uh, where you're laying tiles, you know, trying to create your, you know, overworld and trying to trap the heroes because you're the uh, baddies in this one. And what I really loved about this, not only the shared board, but the new tiles that they have, uh, these have different abilities, including an ability where you can move the other tiles. So it's really uh, got a little tiny bit of take that because you can move your opponent's tiles and you could also put certain tiles that you may not want onto your opponent's side, but they could do that to you as well. Now, uh, so it takes the um, single boards that they normally have an over boss combines them but you're still going to score on your side of the board um, i like this a lot uh, michelle and i had a lot of fun with it and what the cool thing is you can mix and match with the original overboss you know take those tiles bring them in a duel and vice versa so very cool game um, it's you know one of our favorite uh, tile lane games and uh, overboss duel does it right for two players uh, number four on the list Beacon Patrol. I did a run through on my channel, a solo run through where it has got, there's a lot of Carcassonne baked into the DNA of uh, Beacon Patrol. Uh, it's a very chill game, lovely art, very relaxed vibe where you're out in the ocean and you've got boats and you're trying to take your boat around the ocean. You have a choice of three tiles, you place one down and your boat has to travel to that. So whatever tile your boat is on, you have to put it orthogonally adjacent to it and then that boat has to be able to travel on there. And that means it has to have water next to it because boats travel on water, not land, right? Uh, so each tile can only be placed in a certain orientation. You can't rotate them or anything. So that leads to really interesting choices like where can I place this tile in order to move my boat? And eventually when you have your, you know, tableau built up, you're going to score depending on, you know, how, uh, what tiles are surrounded orthogonally. So if a lighthouse is surrounded, that's going to get the most points. If a boy is surrounded, you get a few less points. And if it's open water, you don't get, you, you score a point, but that open water really helps move that boat around because that's the easiest to move. By the way, did I say, did I tell you it's cooperative? It's a cooperative tile laying game. I, Definitely check it out. I love 
playing it solo and um, it's a really nice chill vibe. That's Beacon Patrol number four. Okay, number three, uh, I did this chat uh, for the channel. It's a, a paid preview for Time Lancers. Now, Richard had already played this uh, on the channel. He, he showed you how to play a multiplayer, a two-player game. Um, I did a sponsored solo run-through. So the solo deck has now been, you know, it's been implemented. It wasn't ready when Richard did his run-through, but it, it was ready now, and I really enjoy this game. This was such a cool mix of theme, which is time travel, uh, your mercenaries uh, traveling back in time to possibly change events uh, for the highest bidder. Um, so you have that... Um, you have worker placement, tableau building, resource management. You go around the cities, get ta uh, resources. Then you go jump in your time machine. And depending on where you place uh, your events, you capture these events, place them, they can have effects that ripple down the line uh, on your timeline and change the other ones that you placed previously. Oh, it's so, so clever, so unique. And it was nominated for a Cardboard Edison. And I can see why, because it really brings this really fresh, unique take on a tableau building slash worker placement and a resource management. Really enjoyed this one. Great, um, great theme uh, tie-in as well. Okay, number two, got two more left. Number two is Challengers. Um, I did a spot or a preview of this or a run through of this on the channel. And gosh, I really like this way more than I thought. It's basically the classic card game war, but um, with modern board gaming elements tied into it. Uh, you've got some light deck building and hand management. And actually, I would consider uh, um, you know showing this to new gamers as a introduction of deck building. You don't have any currency or anything to worry about. You're just adding cards to your deck. And then, you know, you're playing them against your opponent war style. If I have a two, you've got to beat it with a three or, or more. And goes back and forth until someone wins that match. And what's great about this, absolutely love this, you play tournament style. So you do one match, it's only a few minutes. Then you go on to your next opponent, play another match, and keep going until there's been seven rounds total played. And then whoever has the two highest scores, those two players face off in the final match. You have a whole tournament in 45 minutes, folks. It's wonderful. Absolutely love it. And actually, on if you check out the uh, Rado BGG Guild, I have this really nice discussion with a user, a viewer, that um, you know made the case for this being a Kennerspiel nominee, uh, which it is. I had said in my final thoughts that I felt it was more along the spiel, but we attended, we, you know, had a little agree to disagree. So I think it should be a spiel. They talked it was about a Kenner, but we ultimately agreed that, hey, it's a lighter end Kenner spiel um, nominee and well deserved in our opinion. Okay, number one on the list. I mean, no surprise here. This is a sponsored pre preview that uh, Michelle and I did for the channel Dog Parks New Tricks, my favorite game of the month. It has a pug. It's a dog walking game. I love this. Michelle and I really enjoy the base game and the expansion adds three new things that really level up the complexity without destroying or changing the uh, original gameplay. We are dog walkers bringing dogs into our kennel by um, bidding on them with our victory points. Really nice tension there. How many points do you want to give up for certain dogs? And then you take them for walks, gather resources, and uh, get ready for the next round. What the expansion does is adds new objectives, new locations. So it's going to change locations where you're going to walk um, by actually having like little overlays on the board, which is great. And finally, um, actually also has multi-breed dogs, which are awesome because now you can qualify for more uh, end game goals and in game goals uh, with the multi breeds. And finally, the tricks. This is where it really shines. The tricks, you are going to train a dog every round to do a certain trick, depending on the breed, of course. And then those tricks can trigger special abilities on different parts of the game, whether they're in the kennel or when you're on the walk. So it's a little bit more going on. I like how it ramps up the complexity without, with, while still keeping the original gameplay. Absolutely love it. It's a winner in our book. That's Dog Park's New Tricks. Now, for more of about the games that I played this month, and more importantly, about the games you played this month, I do this live on my Twitch channel every month, and this time it's going to be on Sunday, July 2nd. And if you can't make it then, that's fine, because I export it over to my YouTube channel. So I'm going to talk about the games I played, along with the games that you played. So come and check it out. Check out the show notes below. And uh, until next time, folks, happy gaming. Bye. Bye. Uh, great list, Kimberly and Ruel. Ruel, I had no idea until just now that that, um, oh, was it, Overboss Duel 
is also an expansion for regular Overboss. I had completely ignored it because of the dueling stuff, but now I desperately have to have it as an expansion because, uh, spoiler alert, folks, as much as everybody loves Cascadia, Overboss is the superior game, in my opinion, anyway. And, oh, Kimberly, I am so jealous. You got that Books of Time video. Uh inside baseball type stuff here, folks. Uh, the publisher was originally going to send that to me for coverage, but they messed up and sent it out to Kimberly instead. So she's the one who got to play it. And oh, I'm even more sad because you rate it so high. I must get my hands on that. But Anyway, folks, uh, thanks, gang. Now, that wasn't all we had on the channel from contributors. Because Shay was up for Planet B. Uh, he's still getting back up to speed after his epic trip to Japan. Um, but anyway, I was so glad that he did a run-through for this one because... I, it's very, very impressive title from publisher Hans and Gluck, who are, can always be counted on to put out really fantastic designs, pretty much without fail. And uh, this is no exception, but what's really interesting is it's kind of a new foray for them into the world of political satire. It's basically set on an alien planet, uh, Planet B, which is where humanity had to go after they pretty much ruined Planet A, also known as Earth. But wouldn't you know, all the problems we had on Earth, we ended up taking to Planet B. So it is a very interesting worker placement game where we are corrupt politicians trying to accumulate power for ourselves and manipulating the uh, gullible populace. And it's got a lot to say about our real modern world, kind of in the best Star Trek tradition, but with, uh, with a wicked sense of humor. And on top of that, it's got some very, very cool um, notions for the way it handles shared worker placement, which is sort of unique, and also a really neat, um, uh, what do you call it, voting system. You know, when elections come along, because the elections are all rigged, and you're trying to do the best job to rig it in your favor. So if you're looking for really great gameplay, meshed with um, really uh, interesting uh, socio-political commentary, you uh, might want to check out Ruel, not Ruel, Shay's run-through of Planet B. Okay, everybody, and here we go. We're starting with my countdown. But before we actually start counting, I have an honorable mention. It's the Castles of Burgundy uh, Special Edition, which I did cover this month. I ran through the solo mode that is available. Um, and let me just say right off the bat, it's fantastic. My hat's off to the team that developed it. Oh, it was just so satisfying to play. But more importantly... I'm not putting in the countdown because I covered this back, I think, in October of last year in an earlier roundup, and I gave it my game of the month back then. And there's no reason to give it the game of the month again, because it would be. But I did just want to say, as I predicted back in October 2022, if the uh, final version lives up to the prototype I played, this was actually going to push the game higher rank than it ever has been before, and it is. Castles of Burgundy, because of this special edition, is now my number three highest ranked game of all time. I think for the longest time, it was like my number six or my number seven and it's just pushed even higher it's so good the solo is so good everything about this game is absolutely amazing and i love it but now let's get to the actual countdown shall we starting with a number 11 on the list we have got expeditions and now this is the newest hot game from stonemeyer games and i do have to say it is a phenomenal design i am incredibly impressed by it and i'm also very thankful to alex Hart of Might I Suggest a Game, who drove all the way to my house to sit down with me in this very room and teach me how to play, and he and I filmed a run-through together, and it was a good old time. And when I did my, when we, when we talked about the game, it was mostly his final thoughts, because he'd actually played it several times, and when you saw me in that video, I'd only played a third of a game with him. I have now played the game several times. I've played it solo. I've played it two-player with my wife, and I was very surprised to find that it comes in at the bottom of my list. And it's not to say it's a bad game at all, but it's probably not one Jen and I are going to be keeping. There's a few reasons. Uh, probably the main one is that there's really nothing done for player scaling. And as a two-player experience, the board is so wide open that... Um, there's really not that much pressure, even though this is really more than anything else. At its heart, a race game. Uh, you know, we, there's really nothing ever getting in your way. There's no real confounding elements. Oh, if you're in my way where I need to go, well, you'll get out of my way next turn because you're pretty much moving every other turn, and so it's no big deal. Uh, it's interesting. I played the solo mode, and I was really impressed by it. And you know, the it's it the, the there is more tension and excitement played solo than there is as a two-player game. So. 
on a whim, I went back and I did an experiment. I brought the solo Automa rules into the two-player game. And I gotta say, that hugely improved the tension and excitement level because there's two other mechs you know, stomping around the environment instead of just me and one other person. But at the end of the day, I did find that the uh, solo Automa really isn't ideally brought into a multiplayer game because it could, through random luck, really favor one player over the other. And we found that did happen quite a bit. So unfortunately, that didn't really work. Also, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, having played it as much as I have now, I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've enjoyed every play I've had of it. It's, it's in no way, shape, or form a bad game. And probably the most impressive thing about the game is the huge variety in card effects. This is not a game like, you know, the original Lost Ruins of Arnak, where, okay, there's just a lot of the same kind of stuff, just, you know, and very, very simple things. You know, you will get cards, different cards, and every time you play, that will radically change your overall strategy because they really mix things up. And I'm very appreciative of that. But I gotta be honest, I love the cards. It's the world I don't particularly love. I don't really dig you know, stomping around in a mech to get to the proper harvest fields, whatever I need. I would almost think I would enjoy this game more if it was a pure deck builder. If the board was gone completely and we weren't moving around from space to space, but we replaced that with some other core action. As I think the card play, the hand management, the combos between the cards, the multi-use nature of the cards, all that stuff is next gen really best of class but the the board traversal especially with those travel tokens alex mentioned this a little bit and i can certainly agree it is there needs to be something more done with those uh it, you know it's so anticlimactic to uh you know i mean they, they they're just you know there they, they there could be so much more there and so half of the game is best of class the other half of the game is good, but as a two-player game, only so-so because the tension goes away, which is why, sadly, very surprising for me, Expedition comes in at the bottom of my list at number 11 for the month. But then let's move on to number 10 on the list. We have got um, a, a Scoviteer, or uh, Scoventeer. At least that's what it looks like the way you pronounce it to me. But I, one of my favorite things about this game is uh, because the whole thing is based on Danish fairy tales, there is a pronunciation guide at the end of the rulebook. And it seems like half of the consonants in the alphabet are silent in Danish for some reason. So the uh, proper way to pronounce this game is Scoventeer. Scalantir. And um, I'm really impressed by it. First of all, it is Drop Dead Gorgeous, a really beautiful production. Uh, it's got art from Vincent Dutre, so of course it looks just the bee's knees. But the design is very interesting because it is from Morton Monrad Peterson, who is the head of Atoma Factory. So he is known for coming up with uh, solo variants to existing games. And this is his first published game. And I was very, very excited for that, especially because it's not, while it is, I think at its heart, a solo game that you could then play as a multiplayer game. Um, I, I, you, know, you can play. It's his first multiplayer design as well. And that's actually why the game comes in at number 10. Because played as a solo game, this is great. A really, really enjoyable experience, full of tension as we're trying to, uh, you know, help this uh, forest spirit stay one step ahead of uh, demonic forces and and fight them off through card drafting. And the thing is, every time you get a card to your hand that's going to give you a special power to play later, unfortunately, you have to suffer a really bad event immediately. And mitigating this onslaught of negative events so you can get to the good events with your cards is really sharp. It's a wonderful, fun fast-playing, puzzly game. And as a solo game, it's great. It would rank significantly higher on my list if I were ranking it as a solo. But I'm ranking it as a multiplayer game. And it works, but there was pretty much nothing done to um, make it a multiplayer game. This is still just a, a solo game where, oh, just the cards get split up amongst the players, which makes it, if anything, a slightly bit more challenging because there's more timing issues that, oh, if only I had that card, you know, but we have to wait for your turn to play it. And so I wish there was something done to multiplayer it up. You know, I, I, I don't even know what, you know, uh, you know, an elaborate sharing of card system or a limited communication system or something. This game is at its heart a solo game and it is a great solo game. I highly recommend it. And um, it's an okay multiplayer cooperative game as well. But uh, if you're looking for a fun, beautiful uh, solo game um, with, uh, you know, just so much charm, you might want to check out number uh, 10 on the list, Scalantir. 
Okay, or Skoventir, yeah, depending on how you might pronounce that. Then let's move on to number nine on the list, Pyramido, which uh, is a brand new tile laying game that is really sharp. It's largely an abstract game where we are drafting dominoes and uh, marking sections of them as we draft them so that we will score them later. And, you know, I have played a lot of pyramid-building games over the years. It's a rel- surprisingly common conceit in board gaming. And one thing that's always struck me as odd about them is the way that you can start working on one level but then start building on additional levels, which just seems kind of weird. I really love the fact that this game, no, you have to finish your entire base level before you go to the next level and the next level and then the final level because you're building a four level three dimensional pyramid out of dominoes. So the interesting thing is every time you finish a level, that's when you trigger a mid game scoring and you're trying to get the different colored sections of your dominoes lined up with scoring tokens on them with more scoring icons inside those dominoes so you can get big scores. But here's the interesting thing. Once you finish the ground level and everybody scored all the ground level and you start building the second level, your second level starts covering up the majority of the scoring icons cons from the ground level, and only the outskirts ones are left. But if you can build smart when you're building your second, your third level, you can be uh, laying things out so that, hey, when I put this on my second level, it'll reactivate the scoring of my first level, the stuff that's still exposed. And that is very cool. I really, both Jen and I were very impressed. This is a fun, sharp, fast playing, I mean, it's less than a half an hour. It's almost a filler length game. It's largely abstract, uh, but, you know, it, it still have a really great table presence. I mean, these little colorful pyramids we're building are just gorgeous. The components are nice. And um, the tension is there. Am I going to be able to get the domino I desperately need to be able to activate my second and first level um, icons when I get to the third level? I mean, there's some brinksmanship of, you know, I'm actually purposely going to try to score less this round so I can go first next round so I can get that. Because another thing, too, when you take a tile, you pick what new tile gets added to the draft area and players can see what all the tiles are. So you can do a fair bit of you know tactical and strategic planning. It's really sharp. I think a lot of people are going to love this. And honestly, my only problem with it, other than the fact that it's a it's a fairly abstract game, I mean, I but that's okay. Uh, it, it's still a lot of fun. But the main thing is because you have all that advanced planning you can do to determine what um, tiles are going to be available next round, and you can see what tiles are going to be available the round after that. I found as a two player game, uh, you know, a lot of my decision making was less about hey, what's best for me because oh, these are all good for me, but what hurts you the most? if I keep it buried or if I take it from you. There are the hate drafting and more importantly, the um, hate refilling of the draft queue is strong with this game as a two-player experience because it's so easy to see what you are so desperate for. And you know, if just one quick move, I can keep that from you and make you lose 10 or 15 points, that is painful painful. Um, and uh, I don't think that would happen at a higher player count because you really couldn't be able to keep track of like three other players' pyramids. But as a one, as a two-player game, because there has no solo mode, as a two-player game, it's sharp and it is kind of cutthroat in a go-like kind of way, which I think is going to be great for a lot of people who are looking for those opportunities to, you know, undercut your opponent and keep them from doing, you know, getting those big massive scores while still pulling off those yourself. It's fun, it's fast, it's gorgeous, it's satisfying, it's really smart, but it is a little bit cutthroat as a two-player game, which is why uh, Pyramido comes in at number nine on the list. Then, funnily enough, we move on to number eight, Pyramids. Uh, Like I said, folks, I've played a lot of pyramid games over the years, and they never go out of style. There's just something so satisfying about building a pyramid in board game form, either with cardboard tiles or with uh, you know cards, however it might work. And this game is fantastic. It is uh, fast, smart, a uh, really clever game uh, that you know really has two halves. Uh, first of all, there's the draft. You know what cards you're going to get that you're actually trying to build in a given round, and that has kind of a King Domino vibe to it, where the better ones that you can get are probably going to make you go later in turn order in a later round. You know, and that King Domino system always works, and it works so well here. It's it's really nicely implemented. But the interesting thing is, you're not trying just to build a pyramid in this game. You're building a pyramid and an obelisk and 
a tomb. So every time you get a card, that card can go into one of three different things. And these things all score differently. And, um, you know, I, the most interesting thing, the tomb is secret. Now, I can't see what you put in your tomb as often as not. And so that'll get revealed at the end of the game. But, you know, as you build your obelisk, you're trying to push your luck to get a series of the same color. You're trying to get color matching as opposed to level matching when you're working on your pyramid. And then you're trying to do set collection in your tomb. So you're really kind of playing three different games with every round of drafting you're going through. And um, as the pyramids build faster and faster, and we run out of time and we're desperate to get that last card, that's when the King Domino draft comes in. And this is great, folks. Uh, this one, I think, is definitely a keeper. I don't think my wife would forgive me if we got rid of it, because she really loved it, and I enjoyed it quite a bit, too. Number eight of the month, Pyramids. Okay, now let's talk about number seven, My Island. Uh, this is the sequel to Reiner Knizia's wonderful legacy tile-laying game, My City, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. And interestingly, I'm going to be doing a run-through of this next month, so I don't actually have video of it right now. There aren't very many pictures of it on Board Game Geek either, unfortunately. And that's because it is a legacy game, and they don't necessarily want to spoil a lot of stuff. I'm not going to spoil a lot of stuff right now, other than to say... Uh, if you're, I mean, right now you can go watch my run through of my city, which was a legacy tile laying game where you were using polyomino tiles to build up a city over multiple decades after you play session after session after session and more and more stuff unlocks game after game after game. And then once the game is done, there is an eternal mode, which is kind of like where the game was halfway through and you can just play over and over and over again. And that's all very nicely done. Uh, and they do the exact same thing here. There's a few changes. One, instead of polyomino tiles, we are using um, different shaped hex dominoes, or triominoes, or quadominoes. So it's still the same type of tiling, but the interesting thing is the hex tiles make it a little bit more easy going. Uh, because it's always easy to kind of... Well, not always. Sometimes you can put yourself in a bad situation. But generally speaking, I, you know, because the main thing is, when you're laying these tiles down, at least one of the hexes on your little domino or triomino or whatever has to match one of the existing ones. So you have to be smart. As you expand, you, know, you always have to be leaving yourself options in all directions. And it's a bingo-style game. So every round we reveal a card, everybody lays that same tile however they want to, on their own little island, and it's sharp. The tile laying in this game is excellent. I think, at the end of the day, I prefer my city a little bit more because I prefer polyominoes to hexes because the polyominoes are basically just a tougher jigsaw puzzle to try to fit together. But this one, the hexes make it more easy going, but then having to match, forced to match colors as opposed to optionally max colors makes it uh, a little bit more forgiving, but still an engaging puzzle in my island. Now, I've only, at this point, played about halfway through the campaign, and I've been very impressed by everything that's unlocked. But this breaks my heart. This has an eternal mode, too. That yeah, Once you finish the 24-chapter campaign, and each game takes like 15, 20 minutes. Once you finish the campaign, you can just keep playing this over and over and over again. But it's like the game is perpetually stuck in Mission 9 of the 24. So over half the stuff that you can ultimately unlock that creates so many cool new features, I've seen several of them, I haven't even opened all the envelopes yet. Once you finish the game, half of that, more, more the majority of the really, really cool, fun, quirky offbeat stuff gets thrown away. And I don't understand why they did that. They did this with My City, and it was heartbreaking. And I was hoping that Reiner Knizia and the, My Co and the Cosmos team wouldn't repeat that mistake, but they did. So, if they hadn't, I, again, I mean, it's a bit early to say. I mean, I will have played through the entire campaign for the time I do my run-through next month. But I can say right now, I am not judging this as a legacy game. I am ranking this as a tile, as just a tile laying game in the eternal mode, and it's 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 very very good. Uh, it's very very enjoyable. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it because at the end of the day, I think the standalone game of My City is more engaging because there are literally more rules, more things that I have to keep in tra track of. Uh, my Island is a little bit le more laid back, less rules intensive, at least from what I've seen so far. So, I mean, I I we're enjoying it. I'm definitely looking forward to finishing the whole thing. And then I'm dreading the sadness I will find when, hey, all these cool things that we unlocked, we have to basically 
toss them because they're useless just because the developers didn't do that tiny bit of extra work they needed to say, hey, let's find a way to dynamically work all of these other features into the game so it has, so it could be one of the greatest tile errors of all time. I said this about My City too. It could be one of the greatest tile errors of all time, but instead it's just a really, really good tile error. And it seems like My Island is following in its footsteps, which is why it comes in at number seven of the month, My Island. Then we have got New York City. Now, this is uh, Stefan Feld uh, revisiting one of his classic designs, Rialto, but um, moving it to a new location. Um, and, you know, it's left Europe and we're now in the U.S. We are building skyscrapers instead of exerting our influence in a Renaissance era city, but the gameplay itself is, is the same. Where every round, we're going to go through a series of auctions where we bid based on cards that at the beginning of the round we drafted to get. And I mean, you can go right, right, you know, right now. You can go back and watch my Rialto run through I did a billion years ago, and you'll get a good eighty-five to ninety percent of a sense of what this game does. I mean, this game is much prettier. I love the little skyscrapers. The game has such a wonderful table presence. Um, it's really, really nice, and the uh, extra pieces uh, that. Or, I mean, it's, across the board, it's a it's a it's a component upgrade. And honestly, I like activating people, paying them money to get their special powers, rather than activating buildings. So I think the the uh, it, there's more flavor to it as well. But more than anything else, I mean, like all of the um, the new city series of games that Stefan Feld has been doing, where he's taking his older games and revisiting those designs and tweaking them and upgrading them. I would have to say he's done that with New York City, and this is the best he's done so far. This game is so. So much better than Rialto. I thought um, Hamburg was better than Bruges. Amsterdam is kind of tied for me with Macau. I'm kind of hard-pressed to say. I think I might still prefer Macau, but there's no denying New York City is head and shoulders in every meaningful way. New York City is the superior game to Rialto. But the only thing Rialto has over New York City is it's a smaller box, which is not an insignificant consideration. Um, and so I was very, very impressed by that. It also has a really, really nicely implemented solo mode, but this is one of my big problems I have with the game, the rules, first of all, the rules for the solo mode have a radical misprint that I'm not going to go say breaks the game, but can create such a fundamental misunderstanding of how to play the solo mode that, you know, it's just really kind of unforgivable uh, just how bad this error is. And they haven't even fixed it in the rules you can download online. It's still wrong in the English rulebook anyway. Um, but that, it also bugs me too because, you know, this is an auction game and you can bring the solo system into a multiplayer game. So a two player auction become much more dynamic when there is a third bidder. Plus, it's also an area majority game too, so having a, another com comp competitor for the area majority works great. Except the rules say, yeah, you can bring this solo mode into the multiplayer game. Or you can even go, uh, compete against multiple solo opponents in the solo game. But... Um, the rules are so incomplete. They are clearly written assuming you would only ever use it as a single opponent in solo, and there are so many open questions. I had like a dozen questions. I have posted to Board Game Geek. I haven't heard anything yet. It's been over almost a week now, and I'm still waiting to get the answer for these. And so I don't know if I've actually played the game correctly at this point. And that's really disappointing because the thing, I mean, again, Everything about this game is superior. And if you're looking at Rialto and saying, hey, I liked Rialto, uh, is this better? Yes, it's so much better. And even as a player count too, but I'm really, really frustrated that I cannot figure out how to properly play this solo uh, Automa player and bring them into a multiplayer game because that might really elevate the game you know, to all new heights. So... Still kind of on the fence. But in spite of that, I mean, Rialto was, it was never my favorite Feld game. I mean, well, I think it was my number 10 when I did a top 10 Feld games almost a decade ago. And I don't think it would make my top 10 Felds anymore at all. But it's still a, Rialto is still a great game, and New York City is even more fantastic. Just unfortunately, there's some rules snafus that could use a little bit of work. Okay. Then, let's move on to number five on the list. Uh, Dorf Romantic, the board game. Now, this is based, I guess, on a very, very popular uh, video game, which I've never played. I don't know much about. Uh, but more importantly, it has been nominated for the Spiel des Jahres. And honestly, I, I, I think the uh, smart money is that it will win the Spiel des Jahres based on its competition. And here's the deal, folks. I think it should. 
I am blown away by how good this game is. And honestly, I went in thinking this was going to be my lowest rated game of the month. Uh, because, oh, it's a Spiel Charge game. That means, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a game for family and kids. It's a gateway game. It's going to be really, really lightweight. I do appreciate the fact, and I wish, I'm, I hope this is a signal of more to come from the Spiel des Jahres nominee, um, not, nom, you know, uh, jury, because it is a cooperative game, and I think cooperative games are much better gateways to bring families in than competitive games. And it's a tile-laying game. And here's why I thought I was going to hate it. And honestly, this is my least favorite thing about the game. It's a solo game. It really, really is. There's um, Because there's nothing done to make it feel like a multiplayer game. Like players, hey, uh, here, you know, I tell you what, I've um, I'm going to give this to you so I can do this other thing. There's no way we can interact with each other. We just all... its it, Oh, is it my turn? Well, I would do the exact same thing. I mean, if you played the game and played five turns in a row, it would play the exact same way as if you and I were playing and you took three turns and I took two turns. There's nothing to make it a multiplayer game. It is a communal puzzle-solving thing more than it is a game. And that's a huge disappointment. And honestly, I thought that was going to just pretty much ruin the experience for me and for Jen. Um, plus, then on top of that, it was going to be a, a, a lightweight gateway, and so why is it not going to be interesting? And yet, here's the deal, folks. This is a keeper. This is coming in very, very high at number five on a, a month full of really good games. Why do we love it so much? Well, if you look on the screen right now, you will notice over on the right side, there are, what is it? All right, in this particular example, I was just doing a little bit of filming to, so I could have something on screen. This is where we are in our campaign. This is a campaign game that you will play through dozens of times. And the game comes with, I think it was either five or six boxes full of additional stuff. That The more you play, the more you unlock new ways to score points. Um, at the end of the day, this is a game that's very chilled back. Ch uh, chillax. Laid back and chill. Um, because all you're trying to do is just score the best points you can by laying tiles and matching different groups and you know trying to make sure longer, longer rail lines and really simple, straightforward stuff. At least, that's what it is when it first starts. But, and honestly, the first few games, your first three games of this game are, are a slog. Uh, honestly, we played halfway through our first game and said, oh my god, this is so terrible. Tell you what, how about we just look up how the campaign works, and we're just going to pretend we have played the next four games. And let's see, what will we have unlocked over the first three games? Unlock those, and then suddenly, boom, the game exploded. Because if you look on screen, you'll notice over on the right, there are five cards at the top. Those represent different new rules that I have unlocked. And I'm not going to go, I don't want to spoil anything here, but there are lots of really, really cool special tiles that get added. They are a lot more interesting than the basic tiles. But more importantly, the longer you play, the more you give yourself new objectives. That's what those, what is it, nine cards are over on the right. Imagine a simple tile layer like Carcassonne, where every time you play, you've got anywhere um, upwards of a dozen different objectives that you could be trying to achieve, in addition to just scoring the most points possible. Because every time you complete one of those objectives, you'll unlock more stuff. And in this way, it is so compelling. Jen and I, we played a few games, we're like, oh my gosh, we've got to play one more, because if we unlock, if we, if we just get that box up, but what's in that box? And you know, we've seen this before. This is not new, but it is done so much better here because I believe the developers are borrowing from their video game um, origin of this. Because a lot of times, the objectives you get, you look at it, and it's like, this is impossible. There is no way I could achieve this. I can't get 18 points off of uh, clover pieces. I made that up. There are no clover pieces. I'm just making something. I don't want to spoil anything. How could I possibly do that? And the thing is, um, later on, you'll open a box and like, oh, there's a second clover in here. And oh my gosh, now could I possibly do this? Uh, at any given time, a bunch of the objectives you look that you have available to you, you can't do until you complete other things and then unlock stuff that will let you go back and revisit those objectives you thought were impossible. And in this regard, this is straight out of Legends of Zelda or Castlevania or Metroid. I think it's called Metroidvania gameplay design, where you know the game gives you doorways and you have to find the key to be able to open the doorways. But the keys aren't just keys, they're new tools you can use to do other stuff. And the developers have brought that into this game so freaking brilliantly. It is so compelling. And while I have heard some reviewers say, yeah, the game is so simple, nine times out of ten, it's really obvious where to put your tile, and there's no real need for group discussion, those people have not played the game enough. Because once you've got nine different objectives, and there's no way you're going to be able to finish more than one or two or three of them. And to be able to do it, you have to build towards that, hoping you're going to get that, that key tile and you have to leave spaces open. You do have to make interesting, tough trade-offs to be able to complete these really, really tough objectives where, oh, you know, normally I score around 120 points. I have to score 500 points 
How am I going to do that? Okay, I have to bend. I have to this entire game. We have to bend on trying to complete this objective, and <gasps> we just unlock something that I think is going to maybe make that possible. And that's what really makes this game special. It would be even more special if they had done any work at all to really make it a multiplayer game rather than a solo game that you can just share the experience with other players. But you know what? The, the the you know the game is beautiful. It's really satisfying the little landscapes you make and that unlocking and growth uh, system, which by the way is completely resettable. So once you have played I don't know thirty or so games, you can just reset all up and have that whole experience again and unlock things in a different direction. So good. I doff my cap to the Spiel des Jahres jury. They made the right choice nominating this, and if it wins, I think they'll have made the right choice as well. Adorformatic, the board game, is absolutely amazing. I'm very impressed by it. Okay, then let's move on to number four. On the list, we've got uh, Menakshi Temple. Now, this is a sponsored preview that I'll be doing for a game that's uh, launching and crowdfunding next month. So you're seeing this a little bit early. What is it? It is great. Um, this is a very, very smart game that once again uses the King Domino style of drafting. And we are trying to draft actions plus statues because we are actually trying to make these temples that are based on uh, real world temples. Um, or they're called Gopuram temples, if I recall correctly. And the interesting thing about these temples in real life is they're built tall on layer upon layer on pair of beautiful, colorful statues. So we're trying to draft these statues into incredibly tight, restrictive storage spaces, which is something I always particularly enjoy. Um, and then get those statues transferred out to our actual building slabs. So it's got kind of a onesie twosie, uh, almost Castles of Burgundy vibe to it. Where I don't have much storage. I'm, oh, I really want to get these things, but I don't have enough place to store them, but I can't let you get them and stuff like that. I got to get this stuff cleared out so that I can build these other things. And you can expand your storage. You can um, focus on different objectives. And there is so much going on with this game that is absolutely brilliant. This has got to be maybe the best implementation I've ever seen of a King Domino draft because it's not just the, the draft um, pairs are just randomly thrown together. They are instead um, you know, pre-designed on a series of cards. And the important thing is... I can see what I'm drafting for now, but also, you know, because the whole point of a King Domino draft is, hey, if I take the worst thing, that the, the weaker thing, that means I'll be in a better position next round to go first. But in most King Domino games, including King Domino, you don't know what's coming next. In this game, you do. You know that while I'm jumping over here to get this particular power and this particular turn order space and these particular statues or whatever it is you're going to grab, um, you're also figuring out how important is it for me to go first on the next round because I can see what's coming in the future. And that extra level of planning so elevates this. So elevates this game. Also, I mean, there are so many things I could talk about. Our players have unique special playing powers. You, there's an engine building aspect because as you as you unlock more cards, they can uh, make you strong for certain actions, which means you really want to do those actions, which then becomes another consideration on the King Domino draft. But then, on top of all of that, if all that weren't enough, these towers we're building, we're really building towers. We have to build a, a, a firmament of like four statues on a card, and there's like a set collection element of getting the right color statues in the right color place to trigger bonuses. And I mean, there's so many bonuses within bonuses within bonuses within this game. But once you've got enough statues to do ground floor, you can literally grab a card and build a second story, and then start putting statues on that. And the game is over once, if I recall correctly, somebody has finished their five-story statue. And the thing is, by the time you're there, when we're done, we don't want to tear it down. We're so proud of what we built. It's so pretty, and it's so tall, and it's so satisfying. And the journey to get there, and I haven't even told you about everything. The the way the... Um, oh, man... The, the, there are special bonuses you can get that you have to that you have to give back under certain circumstances. I mean, it's it's really really blew me away. Now, like I said, this was a sponsored preview. You'll be able to see my preview video for it very very soon. And so right now, I, I, I imagine I'm just whetting your appetite. But folks, be on the lookout for number four of the month, um, in Oxy Temple. I was blown away by it, and so was Jen. Okay, then let's go on to. Number three, our Chaos Society. And now, this is basically um, a very, very popular 
card drafting area control game. It came out, it was, I think maybe two years ago. There was one, it was called Ethnos. It's hugely popular, made a lot of people's game of the year list. I've never played it because while I thought, oh, I love the card play, the way you're drafting cards, and then, you know, once you get a good hand of cards, you play some of them to trigger the main action you want to do, which was territory acquisition in Ethnos. But then the rest of your hand, you have to give up. It goes back into the draft. And then suddenly there's a feeding frenzy when everybody starts grabbing all the cards you didn't use. I've always thought that was brilliant, but I never wanted to play it because I wasn't interested in an area control game. So, Archaea Society is the sequel. It's a totally new world. Um, we're doing archaeology things all around the world and whatnot with a very diverse cast of characters, really nicely done. And the interesting thing is we're not doing area control uh, in all the different regions. We're doing racing in all the different regions where we're all just trying to get more and more progress to hit certain milestones and score double or triple points for being in first place. The different regions have different special powers, like multiple uh, tracks we have to do, or things that can activate other things. So, the race is excellent. I'm always happy to find a race game that Jen and I really enjoy. But again, it's driven by that same insanely brilliant card drafting hand management system that is what made Ethno so incredibly well-loved. And I totally get it now. Plus, every time you play, the game comes, I think, with like 12 different sets of cards. Each set of cards has different special. So there's like 12 different powers. Every time you play, you're going to get a collection of six of those. Shuffle them up into the big deck, and you're going to get a radically different feeling game because of the way all these different powers interact with each other. This is fantastic. I totally get now why everybody has been raving for years about Ethnos. And I'm so glad I can finally join the party with number three of the month, the Ar Ar Archeos or the Archeos. I'm going to say Archeos Society. Good, good stuff, folks. But not quite as good as number two on the list, Coloma, New Prospects. Now, this was a sponsored preview that I did. Uh, it's uh, fundraising right now, I think, or is about to start fundraising. Maybe next week, yeah. Regardless, so you'll see my full run-through. No, you can see my run-through of this now. It'll go up on GameFound very, very soon. Like I said, I did a sponsored preview. But, um, I mean, here's the deal, folks. Coloma just missed making my top 10 of the year. What was it, like three years ago when it came out? If the New Prospects expansion had been part of it back then, it would have totally made my top 10. This expansion, I think, is going to rocket Coloma out of my um, you know, top uh, 200 into my top 50 games because it brings so much new, full, cool, fun stuff. This is not just a, hey, we just threw in some more cards and just gave you some more content. Uh, while keeping true to the wonderful spirit of Coloma, the new features they have added here um, really expand the game in new and exciting ways. The most single most important thing is this is a game, it's a worker placement game where, you know, Coloma, where you want to send your one worker every round that you get to place to a place where nobody else goes. Because if the, wherever the most players go, there will be a bust and it becomes a less powerful action because it's overcrowded. So you want to be away from everybody else. And that can be a real challenge. There's a lot of mind games because it's a simultaneous worker placement game. Um, here's the thing. With this new one, there is now a new track that every time you bust, you get to make progress on this track. And you can upgrade that and supplement it and do all kinds of things where about half the time, now... You want to bust. There are times playing this where I am so... De I need a bust right now. So in the original Coloma, I spent all my time thinking, okay, that's what I really want to do, but I bet you anything Jen's going to go there. So there's a good chance I would bust. So I'll just wait until next turn when nobody else wants to go there. I just want to stay by myself. Where could I go and everybody will leave me alone? You still have a lot of turns like that now, but you also have a lot of turns where you're like, okay, what's going to be the most popular place to go? Because that's where I need to be. Because I need to trigger a bust now, because that's going to give me that extra horse that's going to give me that extra step so I can make it to Tombstone because there's a limited time offer there because now, I mean, now we're racing more than we ever have before. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? I need to know where you're going. Not to stay away from you, but to join you. And if I can figure it out, do I want to go there? Will I be able to make the main use of that if I so I can trigger the bust? This so elevates the game, just turns it on its head, and just creates such incredibly new avenues for gameplay. For one that I, I love so much, I mean, it's just rocketed. It's so good, so, so smart. Number two of the month, Coloma New Prospects. But folks, as good as that is, there's something even better. Number one on the list is Jump Drive Terminal Velocity. Now, Jump Drive has been in my top 50 games for years, ever since I first played it. Jump Drive is basically um, Race for the Galaxy 
that you can uh, express. It's a race. It's set in the universe of Race for Galaxy. You'll notice a lot of cards as you see from Race for Galaxy, but it's turned into a game that usually only lasts like five or six rounds. is over in 15 minutes, and yet you go from zero to hero so quickly, and just like Race for the Galaxy and Roll for the Galaxy, and, oh, what's the other one? Um, New Frontier? Is that the... Race of the Galaxy, the board game. The, the 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 central thing that's always made me so impressed by this entire series of games is not only are the is the gameplay so brilliant, the card play, the sacrifice of what am I going to discard to be able to play this card, but the storytelling of building your galactic empires. Every time you play, you get an interesting story that evolves um, while the gameplay is absolutely brilliant. And so, John like said, Jump Drive has always been in my top. You can go watch my original run through of it. Uh, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And uh, somehow, a game that was near perfect is even better now with Terminal Velocity. Here's what it adds. It adds components for a fifth player, which is nice. I don't really care, but I'm, I, I think that's great. I would love to play this as a five-player game someday. And so it's nice that that option is now available, but that's not what's interesting to me. It adds an excellent solo mode. Really, really good stuff. Uh, you've got these, like, uh, basically what you do is, uh, to play a solo game, you play four games back-to-back, trying to level yourself up between them and trying to hit these different miles to see if you can actually complete these little mini campaigns. Really nicely done. Um, I mean, just really satisfying. I mean, all the good, fun play that it's always had, uh, but now you can enjoy it by yourself too, and it's just about the perfect solo experience. Uh, next time I um, redo, uh, in a few years, I'll probably do another top 10 solo experiences. This might have to go on the list. Amazing solo. But that's not what really makes me excited, because I still mostly love playing this game with my wife, Jen. And this has added two really big deals. Starting planets. Every uh, when you when you get your starting hand of seven cards, and you have to get down to five. You also get two planets, and you pick one planet. That gives everybody a special power right from the get go. That really kickstarts things and uh, gives you another thing to pay attention to as you're building. These are wonderfully done. They're absolutely brilliant. You'll notice some of them uh, from earlier games. I was surprised to see some old favorites. And what's even more important, goals. Every time you play, three goals are drawn at random. That means everybody, in addition to racing. Uh, it used to be uh, crossing 50 points is what triggered the end of the game. Now it's 60 points because you've got the starting planet um, that gives you a more of a boost and whatnot. Uh, so we're racing to 60 points, but now we're also racing to be the first to get six explorer icons or to be the first to do a level six um, you know, technology or, 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 or the first to explore three mineral planets, let's say. And if you're the first to do it, then boom, it's gone. So we're racing on all these three things. And your reward is you get a token that is worth five points if you never use it. But anytime you want, you can use it to reduce the cost of a development by three or um, a planet by two. And so that can so push you to the next level for your other stuff. Or just don't use them and hold them for five more points as a, you know, as a winning. It's so great. Jump Drive, I mean, it's just going to push Jump Drive even higher. Jump Drive is in my top 50s. Is it going to make it to my top 30s now? It might. It's so great. I am so over the moon excited by the solo mode. Um, I'm happy for people who can play it five players now. But for me, I mean, uh, when Jen and I played it, we were like, oh my gosh, this is better than it ever was. I'm really starting to wonder. I mean, for me, Jump Drive had already replaced Race for the Galaxy. Now, does Jump Drive replace Roll for the Galaxy? It's so amazing now. I'm not quite sure, folks, but I'm just going to leave it right there and say just how incredibly blown away by it. It's my number one game of the month. The expansion, Jump Drive, Terminal Velocity. Okay. And that's it, folks. Another roundup done and dusted. And thank you for watching. And more importantly, thanks to all of these people right here who made this video possible with their support through Patreon or YouTube membership or Twitch, for that matter. You keep us running here on the Rotto Network. And I want to give a special shout out to some folks, Marilyn, Selma Lee, Jerry Reese, Amber Rail, Kisa Griffin, Victory BHG, Issa Samuelionis. Nicholas Elkins, Dennis Inti, Demnois, 2030 CE, KB, Dave Salvatore, Hans Peter Bach, Jimmy Schroeder Hansen, Cobra Misfit, Lex, Chris Arnold, Dr. Fu, Jeff Young, Mom, Gamer, Eric Z, Jeff Huber, Jeff Glazen. No, I'm sorry, Jay Huber. Oh, I, I literally randomized these people's names and uh, somehow the two J's ended up right next to each other. Sorry, Jay Huber and Jeff Glazen, Graham Wallace. Uh, Cheryl Howard, Steve Ercolini, Marlon Cruz, 
Adrian Dong, Chris Steele, Sharon Laubach, Davy Davis, Stacy Lee, Blake Wilson, Charles Hill, Dan Halligan, A. Ooh. Somebody who has said, I appreciate if you don't say my name, and I almost said their name, but A. Ooh. We'll keep it between you and me. Mike Bloom, Heather Rudarian, and Caitlin Albert. And again, thanks once more to everybody else. Okay, folks, we are done. And the screen should be going to black now, and some stuff should be appearing. And you can click on any of those to keep the Rotto Party uh, rolling. And I'm just going to go silent now. Silence. Silence. Click, 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 click.